everyone. Welcome to the eLearning Africa podcast, brought to you by eLearning Africa, the Pan-African network for ICT for education, training, and skills development. Africa's home for ideas, innovation, and sustainable solutions for education, training, and skills development since 2005. I'm Rob Vember, and in this episode of the podcast, I'm in conversation with Sozinho Machinye. My name is Sozinho Matsinye. I'm a linguist by training and the former executive um, secretary of the African Academy of Languages. Sozinho argues the challenge now that Africa has been liberated is to liberate our minds, arguing we should see languages as an asset, not as a liability of any kind. He calls for linguistic equity and talks about his efforts towards achieving that goal by making, if possible, possible. During his tenure as Executive Secretary of the African Academy of Languages, the official language agency of the African Union. In our conversation, we discuss misinformation and disinformation around COVID-19. While communication is part of the problem, Sozinho says it takes us to a much broader issue of the interplay between language and development, his main focal area. Find out why you can't kill hunger with foods cooked in borrowed pots or why you can't lick an empty hand. In addition to the many metaphors he employs, he shares why mother tongue based education or bilingual education shouldn't be seen as a way to solve pedagogical problems. <music> Professor Sozinho Francisco Machinye hails from Mozambique, where his training in linguistics started and continued at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and ended in London in the UK with a master's and a PhD degree in linguistics from the School of Oriental and African Studies. He's a multilingual and visionary professional with over 30 years of high impact experience across higher education, public and private sectors, as well as consulting environments. With knowledge of English, French, Portuguese, and Kiswahili, Sozinho is continually focused on building and strengthening relationships across educational groups, governmental and non-governmental organizations, international partners, peers, and subordinates. From 1992 through 2009, he taught in the Department of African Languages at the University of South Africa. From 2009 through 2015, Sozinho was the Executive Secretary of the African Academy of Languages, the official language agency of the African Union. And in September of 2015, he was appointed Deputy Executive Secretary of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, an independent Pan-African research organization which focuses on social sciences research in Africa. I'd like to start by going back even further to the Sozinho in Mozambique, growing up as a child and your first memory of thinking around languages. I mean, it's something that comes to us, you know, naturally we say our first couple of words and, it, and we, we build our mother tongues out that way without really giving much thought to it before getting into a more formal schooling setting. Uh, what were your, your mother tongue language or languages growing up and how did your fascination with languages evolve from that point? Well, that's a very interesting question, you know, because if you grew uh, during the colonial time in Mozambique, you were told that if you want to be anywhere where you've never been before, you have to speak Portuguese. So, you know, like now English or French or all the former colonial languages are seen as a passport to something better in life. But as a child, I, I had a very interesting experience because I, I spoke both Portuguese and, uh, and, uh, and my mother tongue, which is Tonga, you know, one of the official languages in this country in South Africa. So I, I, I had the two languages, sort of bilingual setting. Why was this? Because my family, my grandfather in particular, was a very, very respected person. He said, you know, you have to speak Portuguese in order to understand the white man's way of doing things. 
And when it's cold, you will be having a place in the sun with the others who speak Portuguese. And, uh, but he said, you know, you can speak as much Portuguese as you want, but you won't become a Portuguese, you know, man. So you have to speak your mother tongue, which is the, the, you know, the anchor, the depository and the vehicle of your culture. So this is how I grew up. And it was very interesting because when I started my secondary education, I have to go to Lorenzo Marquez, now Maputo. And uh, each time, uh, you know, we had a holiday, the school closed. Uh, the following morning, I have to take the bus to go back to the village so that I don't forget my roots. And I will mix, you know, there with people who didn't have the, 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 the chance of going to school, the community and all that. So I thought of having the two things, but the main point was I was told that I have to learn Portuguese while keeping my language because I could speak as much Portuguese as I can, but I wouldn't become a Portuguese person. So. That to me was really, really something which you know played a very important role in the way I looked at the languages and culture and how people interact with each other. I instantly had thoughts and visions of of my own father, who was a Cape Townian, you know, born and bred in Cape Town, South Africa, who kind of spoke the Queen's English and refused and in fact detested Afrikaans uh, as a language in the South African setting and of course there's all kinds of conversations that continue now about we just having celebrated Heritage Day in South Africa uh, last week and conversations around Afrikaans and its origins and and trying to move away from this conversation that it's you know within the sole provision of being a language of the oppressor and in fact no that's not who the language should belong to historically. My roundabout way of getting to your point where your dad encouraged Portuguese as the, as the colonizer's language because of this thinking of this is how you're going to get ahead in life. Where do you stand on that debate now? Are we still suffering from that kind of thinking that the language of the colonizer is, is the only way, thinking of English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, are we, are we still paying for that kind of thinking today? Yes, I mean, uh, but that's a very interesting question. Look, we, we, we need to accept, you know, one fact which is still with us, we, we, we can't deny it, particularly in academia environment where you debate issues. Yes, English, French, Portuguese and Spanish are languages of the colonizer. Africa has been liberated. You, you have uh, national flags flying all over the continent. Now, the, the challenge is to liberate our own minds. You know, if I can quote my, from my colleague, uh, Ngubu Ationgo, you know, decolonizing the mind. And sometimes, like now, there's a lot of um, narrative and, uh, and discussion about decolonizing, the coloniality of the curriculum and all that. But sometimes we, we seem to miss the point. What is it that we want to decolonize? I, I think once Africa you know, is liberated from the colonial rule, what we need to have in terms of our languages is some kinds of what I call a linguistic equity. You know, you need to have some kind of um, a distribution of these languages in terms of labor division. I mean, if you are in Cape Town, you go to Guguletu, surely nobody will be uh, amused if you always talk to them in English, because that's not part of what they're doing. Um, uh, but I guess if you spoke what they speak and you speak Afrikaans, they don't be happy. So the language is, is a kind of instrument for, for communication, and that's the main attribute human beings have. So I see Portuguese today as a language, you know, which has been liberated together with Mozambique. Uh, but unfortunately, people still look at it as um, a passport which will take them where they've never been before. And that's where the issue of uh, mental colonization comes in. Uh, I believe, you know, there was somebody, uh, I think you know him in Cape Town, 
you know, this was Neville Alexander, you know, he used to say that, the, you know, if you know many languages, you're a liberated person because you won't be a stranger anywhere. So you see, when I speak to people, I can't claim to speak English. I don't speak any English, but I can communicate in English. So people, I tell them I'm from Mozambique. They say, wow, you can speak English? I said, yes. Then I switch into Swahili. They say, but wait a minute. Where did you learn to Swahili? Do you speak Swahili? So what I'm trying to say is we, we should see languages as an asset, you know, not a liability uh, of any kind. But unfortunately, because of uh, the colonial, you know, baggage, we still think that we, we need to speak, you know, if you are civilized or sophisticated, is when you speak the Queen's English, this type of things, which I think they only contribute to the marginalization of the vast majority of us who have no access to these languages. And so moving to your work within, within the AU and the agency, such a mammoth task and mandate to ensure that more of the African languages are, are brought into the mainstream, so to speak, right? Yes. That, that we, we start communicating more officially with these languages to facilitate, no doubt, amongst other things, trade and looking at the, the broader continental free trade area and so many benefits to us using our own languages, quote unquote, our own languages. Yeah. Where do you start? How, how do you start such a such a project? I mean, how, how do you move that forward? And, and how did you go about it? That was a very interesting experience. We had, you know, a big fun and the challenges. The, the point is, if you look at the charter of the African Union, the, the charter of the African Union says that the working languages of the Union should be English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Arabic. And if, listen to this carefully, and if possible, African languages. So, so our, our starting point while we're engaging the member states was that look here, we have this charter which says, if possible, African languages. So all we are doing here is to try to make the if possible, possible. You know. So how do you do that? That was the main question. Then we, we looked uh, at Africa as a whole, and we discovered that, you know, we have to start from somewhere. It's like when you are plowing the field, I'm taking you back to my village. You know, when you get people there plowing in their fields, it doesn't matter whether they start from the left or from the right or from the front or from the back. What means is that they will plow their field and eventually finish plowing it. So we said, look, for us to make this, if possible, possible, let's look at uh, the linguistic situation in Africa. And there was a big um, inventory which was produced of all the languages uh, in Africa. And we discovered that there were these languages which didn't respect the colonial borders. So we called them, we identified, I think there were 41 around there, and then we called them the vehicular cross-border languages. You know, close to home here, you have Setswana. You know, if you speak Setswana, you go to Botswana, you go to Namibia, you are in South Africa, and the people before they ask you, whether you've got a visa or a passport or something like that, you'll be chatting and doing your own things. Uh, when I speak Sitsonga here, uh, I, 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 I'm at home. You know, people don't even think in their wildest dreams that I'm from somewhere else. So, I mean, we started with this vehicular cross-border language. This was our starting point because otherwise it could have been difficult. And the other thing, about the vehicular cross-border languages was that we wanted to see how language could contribute to the, to the integration of Africa. Because the African Union, you know, first of all, is about integrating Africa and uniting Africa. So how could language contribute to that? So that was our starting point. And we identified quite a number of these languages. And we first, we selected 12. We say, well, in the next, X time, I can't remember the time frames now. 
uh, let's start with this koala. And we went to the member states which shared this language. And we said, look here, this is the language you share. What are the challenges in terms of developing this language so that we can have some kind of partnership and equity with the former colonial language? So we came to South Africa, we brought Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, and uh, we, we created what we call the, the Setswana Vehicular Cross-Border Language Commission. So we identified the priority areas in terms of research. And we did that with Kiswahili um, in East and Central Africa. We did that with Hausa in West Africa. So we identified with the member states a very specific project which would to be undertaken for the language, for example, in terms of uh, uh, developing terminology. So we had, for example, for Kiswahili, we had a, a project with, for Copas. Copas, you collect the words in a language and you organize them. You can put them into your computer. If you want to produce dictionaries, grammars, or whatever you want, you use that uh, you know, uh, database. So that's how we started. And it went well, but we, 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 we had the, the challenge of um, dealing with the language attitudes, you know, because people will say, yeah, the member states accept that, they understand, they have the charter, they are sub subscribed to. But when it comes to the grassroots, you know, you, you have challenges because people will tell you, you are sitting there in Cape Town where you are sitting because you speak English, not, you know, that's a fact of life. So our, our argument was that, yes, we, we need to go together. You know, we need to go together. And if we need to go together, we need to bring some kind of linguistic equity so that even those who don't speak English, English will have its own place. The African language will also have their own place. So that was quite interesting. Uh, it was a big challenge, but we did some wonderful things. And, and one of them was that um, the African Academy of Languages, you know, ACALAN, was really respected and sort of a partner to be reckoned with when it comes to, to the development and promotion of languages, bilingual education, mother tongue education. So we ran across you know, the globe because people started finding sense in what we were saying. So this is how we did it. What were some of those measurements of success or markers of success that you know, point to, look, that worked? or we're seeing definite progress in this particular area? What were some of those markers? Well, some of this mark of success, number one, the language issue in Africa was no longer a peripheral, you know, something discussed informal. So it was part of the main discourse. It was part of the main narrative of, 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 of the African Union. This was really a big success. And if you go, the, the, the issue, even today, the issue of um, the, the, the mother tongue education is still a big debate in many member states because of our work. You know, we laid the foundations for that debate. It's no longer a debate about some unknown wild things. Maybe we can try it. You know, people are now convinced that if, if you want to be where you have never been before, you, you have to move together. You know, you know they're saying that if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, you know, you go together. So yes, this is one thing. Uh, the language issue in Africa is no longer a marginal something. It's part of the debate at the African Union. And, and one thing we wanted to do, because it was done only in, 20, in 2006, was to have a theme, you know, the African Union has a, a, a theme running through the, the year, uh, you know, about languages. We said we need to, to go back to that because we've never done it before, uh, since 2006. And uh, we, 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 that's why we now have the theme. If you check the theme uh, of the African Union, it's much broader, it includes language, uh, heritage, creative industry. So to me, that was the major success. If you check some member states, for example, who have this program, they call devolution, you know, in sort of decentralizing the governance and other things, you will find that one of the things people are doing seriously 
is to use the language of the people. It's no longer a question of uh, when now we're campaigning like now that we hear people speaking other things than English. You know, it's part of, you know, what is happening. And one thing which happened, I can't remember exactly when was that. It was in, um, in uh, I think it was in 2014 or 2013. This was very interesting and it put a, a big challenge to, 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 to Akalan, to us, was that the chair of the African Union, she wanted to do her speech in, in Kiswahili <laughs> at the African <laughs> Union. So we yeah. said, you see your excellence, how can we do that? <laughs> because <laughs> she said, you are the experts. I want to do that, at least the, the introduction. So I said, well, we can try to do it because there are some tricks we do in linguistics. But, you know, but the point is, uh, this was a big statement to say, look, we, we can talk to each other here about our language and in our language. That was the major success. The, the other one was that because you see in Kiswahili, you know, which is the one of the language I used for working, they say you can't lick an empty hand. <laughs> you, you get that one. <laughs> the first time I've ever heard that, that expression. We, we use so many metaphors. There's the beauty about African languages. This means that if you want people to embrace their language, you need to add some monetary or some value to the language, you know, to, to show yeah. them that you can, you, you can, you know, get something out of the thing. And um, we did a lot of campaign. And today, if you read the adverts from the major NGOs, you know, working in the community, they say the knowledge, something like that, the knowledge of the local language would be an added advantage. You know, so if you are working in Lipompo and you know Sipede and Tonga, probably, you, you will have an upper hand compared to the one who only speaks English. That was something we campaigned for uh, uh, and tried to streamline it. And, and, and so the other thing we did, we started um, a sort of a competition. You know, people would write uh, in their language novels, uh, films and things like that. And then we would set up juries from the grassroots, you know, where they live, district, province, up to the nation. And some of them got some, you know, got some good prizes. When I left Akalan, we were busy looking for people to publish their work and they would get royalties and good money in the process. We did that in West African collaboration with ECOWAS because, you know, we also worked closely with, with uh, the regional economic communities in our work. So these are some of the things we can do. The list can go on, but um, if you you listen carefully to the debates in the in the member states, you will find that even in terms of development, they, they, they would include the language issue. And to, to us, that was a major. The, the more we talk about it, it, it becomes less of a taboo, so to speak. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the pedagogical argument in, in a moment, but I want to ask your, your view on COVID and the pandemic and communicating and whether the communication is currently the problem. And I, and I want to be careful with certainly not painting the continent with one brush. I think it's a misnomer to say that there's general vaccine hesitancy on the continent because the continent simply doesn't have vaccine which of course is a separate argument for much of South Africa specifically right now, which there's vaccine and we're struggling to get people to get jabs in the arm. For much of the rest of the continent, I think we need vaccine, but we're seeing a problem in South Africa specifically where both you and I are sitting, where people are hesitant and whether, you know, distinction between outright anti-vax versus hesitant because I'm just not sure I need a few more questions answered. Is there some kind of linkage between misinformation, disinformation, and mother tongue language 
are we losing people because we're not adequately communicating to them in their mother tongue language or is it more a case of people are more easily swayed as well because they're not being communicated to at their level in their mother tongue language I, I hear what you are saying and that has been one of my preoccupations when it comes to COVID and other pandemic diseases you know you take HIV and AIDS and many others when people communicate properly, they, they share ideas, they share experience, they debate issues until they get into a kind of a common denominator. So it should be some kind of a horizontal way of doing things, not top down. One of the, the amazing things, you know, is that you go across the continent, let's move away only from South Africa, but we, you know, we start from here, we go throughout the continent. The technical committees, I, I have not seen them, at least the one I, I see on TV, <laughs> you know, I'm talking about those I see on TV. They, they don't include people from humanities and social sciences. They, they, are don't, they are not there. Actually, if you want to have some kind of a funny way and you amuse yourself, Look for somebody who speaks three or four, because here in South Africa, people are multilingual. You know, here in Pretoria, I walk into a shop, I speak Tsonga. There's always somebody who understands that we will communicate and help me. That's fantastic. You don't find that in many metropolitan areas across Africa. So if you ask somebody you know, he's very competent in these languages, and you, tell, you ask him to, to tell you what is COVID in his mother tongue. <laughs> You'll be amazed. You won't, probably will tell you all sorts of things, but nothing compared to what we hear from the experts we saw on TV advising the government and all that. Yes, part of the issue has to do with communication. We, we don't communicate effectively. You, you, you would hear some policymakers, some of our leaders saying that, oh, you know, we are doing this with the the, the, the traditional leaders in, in, in the language of the people, that is not done in a systematic way. Um, these languages are closely related. You know, take Sutu and Tswana. You know, these people, they, they talk. If there's nobody telling them that you're Msutu or Mtswana, they communicate. But I'm not sure whether they will call COVID the same way. You know, they will use the same thing to call COVID. So yes, communication is part of it. Uh, and that takes us to a much more broader issue of, of the interplay between language and the development. If you want to develop, you, how do you do it? If you want to tell people to wash their hands to prevent the diseases, you say it in English or in the language they understand better, what is it that you're going to do? So yes, that's a big challenge. In, in fact, I, I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day. I said, look, we, we need to... To, he's one of the most respected scholars in this country. He got COVID. So he wrote a passionate piece about you know, the whole thing we went through. I said to him, we need to do some work in terms of um, the research, invite scholars to write and debate about the nexus between pandemic diseases and, and the communication using the language people know best, you know, uh, with special reference to, to COVID. That is one of the issues. Because I, I look, I was telling somebody the other day, because we are debating this, you know, whether anti works or whatever, I said, look, it, whoever thinks with due respect that is not going to be vaccinated or inoculated or whatever, is not going to get a jab because we'll die, the sort of ill-informed narrative, it is really out of order. Because we know for a fact that when a child is born, whether in the rural area, whether in the urban setting, the first thing the mother gets is a schedule of jabs for all sorts of things. So even the people who say they're not going to be vaccinated, they've been vaccinated at some point in their life, <laughs> where there's children. So I mean, we need to communicate. And the best way of communicating is to use all our languages, including the ones people. I mean, it's, this is a very big issue. The other day I was talking to a manager of one of these big banks. He was telling me, you know, Professor, 
if you don't want to stand in the queue there, you know, you download this app, you will do everything at home. I said, fair enough, I, I can do that. I, I accept that. But my issue with you is that inside the bank here, where we are talking from, we look at all the literature about these apps. It's in, 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 in head on collision with what people are saying inside the bank. <laughs> they are not speaking English. <laughs> so, that is my issue with you. Me, I will go home and you download the app. I will master it. I will understand it. But the vast majority of the people you have inside this bank, they don't know what you're talking about. So I said, even the fourth revolution, which is coming, I don't know from where, we have to take it as a bit, <laughs> a bit of salt, because otherwise it will entrench further the, 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 the marginalization of the vast majority of us, which is not what we want when we want to, to have social justice and build harmonious societies and things like that. Very important points that you raised there, this being the eLearning Africa podcast, we're all about ICT and development thereof on the continent. You mentioned your example of, you know, the banking app and the interplay between language and development going from the COVID example. You mentioned, I think your exact words was, you know, a vaccination or inoculation or, or whatever. And I, I was um, a bystander to a conversation recently to that point where someone was arguing that no, 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 no. I, I have no problems with inoculations. I have a problem with vaccinations. And then, of course, could not explain the difference between inoculation, vaccination, and immunization. And, and the point there, you know, perfectly made where we throw these words around with no real sense of the distinction between the two, and because it seems to be underpinned more by a belief system now than it is by any scientific fact. Yeah. To your point about the, the banking app example and I guess the question again of scalability. So we have technology that's available to us, but how do we then take that and make the big kind of differences that we need to people's lives to make sure that when someone has a banking app in their hand, it is available to them in their, in their mother tongue. I mean, there's no silver bullet here, but this is a problem uh, that, that we, we struggle with whether it is education, curricula, or whether it is government services or a banking app. It feels almost impossible and, 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 and exhausting just to think about how we reach them all. Well, I mean, that's what people told me when I got to the African Union. You know, some policymakers, they told me uh, during the meetings of the African Union that, you know, look, you young man, you know, these were old people more experienced than myself. What's wrong with you? How many languages do we have in Africa? How are you going to do that? Remember what I said to you at some point, we have what we call vehicular cross-border languages. To begin with, I'm not saying that we are going to confine ourselves to that, but I'm saying we need to maximize the resources we have. So a language is a resource, not a liability. If and what is very interesting, if you take the example of the bank, is that that bank, you will find it in Botswana, you will find it in Namibia, you will find it elsewhere in, in the Sadak region. So if, for argument's sake, they were to have one app in Sitswana, how many people would they cover? Just to start with, to show people that this thing can work. You know, Yes, they, actually, the African languages are not as many as people think they are. The names we use probably will multiply the languages, okay? But yeah, we have what I, I said was our strategy, the vehicular cross-border languages in Africa. You can start from that. If you are to have an app, say in, in Tonga, that will cover almost 10 million people in Mozambique plus almost 2 million in South Africa. So you have 7 million. You know, a bank that they've got 7 million clients, is not a poor bank, <laughs> it's, it's rich. So the, the point is the political will to do it and accepting to decolonize our minds that this thing can work. I, I always um, 
wonder and the laugh and the cry when I go to China. You know, you, you go to China, uh, they've got apps in their mobile phones, which are quite useful, you know, they, for some reason, I, I say for some reason, because yeah, I usually go to the academic environment where people speak English, but for some reason they go and bring the students who are learning the English, you know, to practice their English. So it will be sort of your guide to show you the market and things like that. If you say to one of these students, I want to go to the bank, he will ask me, or she will ask me, what are you going to do there? You say, I want to go and change money. She hold the cell phone do, 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 in the app there. She will tell you the rate, how long it will take you to walk to get there. And for all that we know, uh, when it comes to writing, you know, to speaking, when it comes to writing, Chinese is one of the most complex languages. They did it and we can do it. Nowadays, the banks, they give you the choice with due respect because this has got a joke. You know, they give the, the choice of getting your money in your language, okay? Although the first time I tried to get my money in song, I almost lost my card. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> Another story, but they, they, they did it, so it means it can work, <laughs> you know. So the, the point is our mindset to to change it and believe that what it is ours can be used to advance our own lives, including our our, our languages. So it, it is how I see it. We start like we are doing for from somewhere, you know, vehicular cross border languages. And we have an app in Setswana. In South Africa, we'll cover three countries. If you had another one from a major bank here in Tonga, and I'm sure this bank operates in Mozambique and Zimbabwe, then you cover three countries. So it is the mindset which tells, when I told the manager of the bank, you know, he looked at me, he said, ah, but you professor, I said, no, this has nothing to do with professor, it's to do with the reality in front of us. <laughs> you know? And so with your professor's hat on, with your researcher's hat on and, and looking at pedagogy and mother tongue instruction or dual language medium of instruction, are we moving? I feel like we're never moving fast enough. Are we doing all that we can? Where, where, where are the gaps that we should, be, we should be stopping or filling as it relates to giving everyone the opportunity? And, and I think... It, you know, we're talking all levels here, not just the tertiary level, but certainly primary and secondary level. Uh, we see it all the time, students uh, struggling to learn, you know, especially the STEM subjects, I feel in particular, one of the reasons why we suffer so badly in certain parts of the continent in those particular areas, because students are having to be forced to learn in English and, and, and not in their mother tongue. Well, I think this is really, it has been the debate going on. But let me say something to begin with, you know, before I answer your question. Mother tongue based education or bilingual education or whatever we want to call it, it shouldn't be seen as a way to solve pedagogical problems. You know, it is the starting point. We, we, we don't say, Oh, the problem with the stems is because they are taught in a language kids they don't. Now, the question is, if there was no problem of, 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 of the stem, what would you do with the language that is spoken by the vast majority of the people? So it is the starting point, which more often than not, we get it wrong. We say, let's have mother tongue based education. Let's have bilingual education to solve a pedagogical problem. And that begs another question, which is, if there were no pedagogical problem, what would be the fate of these languages that carry our culture, that are part of our mental, you know, psychic setup? What would you do with them? So this is, is, is the, the, the starting point. Now, when we, we, whether we come from the human rights perspective with all the people have got the right to learn in their languages, when we come from the pedagogical way of saying it, that you learn better in your language, we know all these things. Now, where are the gaps? Uh, first of all, we need to, to build the systems into place. I always tell my students, you know what? 
when you go to a driving school and they teach you how to drive a car, they don't teach you about Toyota, they don't teach you about Benz, they teach you about the logic of driving a car. So if you get into a new car which comes to the market, you don't go back to the driving school. <laughs> you, know, you lose the system, the logic they taught you about, you know, driving cars in general. You know, so when it comes to mother tongue based education, we need to get the fundamentals. What is it that we need to do to have the mother tongue uh, going seriously? Where are the gaps? What is it that we need to fill up? First of all, we, we, we need to have the political will. So in order to get the political will, civic society, all the organizations, we should make noise together. And now we're at a better time because each time we get the, the results of matric, there's some kind of witch hunting, who's to blame for the poor results we get. <laughs> So the, the, the objective conditions are there to make noise, to say, look here, we need some kind of a political will to change this situation for the better. We are not saying that, you know, when people learn their language, everything will be smooth and cool. No, 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 because the Chinese fail, they learn in Chinese. The Americans fail, they learn in, 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 in English. You know, so we need to have the fundamentals. What is it? that we want to address when we talk about mother tongue based education or mother tongue bilingual education. Now, once we establish that, we go into training, okay? We, we train teachers, not only for mother tongue based education, but teachers for math, science, we, we train them seriously and make sure that they are properly trained. And then we go back, we say for mother tongue, we need to, train people in the pedagogy of teaching mother tongue. If you go to most member states in Africa, I can give you my country as an example, and I will bear the, the, the consequences of that if people come to me, is that we have people who goes to the teacher training college. They are trained to teach, you know, the, tech, the, the, the methods is about teaching Portuguese. And we think, they can teach the mother tongue because they've learned to teach you know, Portuguese is a second language, it won't work. So we need to focus on the training teachers for mother tongue based education. We need to train teachers for all the other subjects. And we need to produce materials, good quality materials, which they will be attractive to the learners. You know, they, they won't think that we are wasting their time, we are playing the, the game of the chicken in my village, you put a head under the wing, it ends up sleeping. You, know, you don't want to do that. You, you want people to take you seriously. So, you know, there's a constellation of actions which need to be in place before we can start. Here in South Africa, if you look at the teacher training, for example, at one point, it was with the teacher training colleges, and then it next move it to university. I don't know where it is now, but we need to consolidate the experience. We need to do research, for example, and know that this is the methodology we need to do. If you do mother tongue based education, there's a transition period. How do you do it? So there is a holistic approach we need, not just one you know, uh, size fits all, it won't work. Because what you have now, in most African countries is that we don't teach our kids English very well. We don't teach them our mother tongue very well. So I don't know what we are teaching them. <laughs> so we need to really go back to the drawing board and say, let's have a system which will have all the micro uh, systems in place for mother tongue based education to work. This is how I see it. Is there an opportunity and you, you'd kind of almost glibly referenced 4IR and, you know, whenever the fourth industrial revolution is coming to use technology to our advantage in this endeavor that, that you think is obvious that, that, that we, to this point, have not been using? Yes, we, we, we need, first of all, we need to, to do research. For example, we have SADC, you know, it's, it's, it's the REC, the Regional Economic in our community for our region here. We need to gather, come together. Remember, 
we share some of the languages. We need to do serious research. We need to record best practices. You know, we say this worked in South Africa, it didn't work in Mozambique, it worked in Botswana, why and how? Once we consolidate all that knowledge, we bring the experts, technology, both revolution, to say to them, look here, this is what we have distilled you know, from our experience. Now we want you to put it into the machine. Because this post revolution, I understand, includes softwares, computers, machines, things like that. So this is what we need to work with you together. And, and when we do it, we'll tell you, no, no, no. From the teaching point of view, this is what we are missing. Let's go this way and that way. And I think if we, we did that seriously, in a continuous manner, we share experiences, we record the best practices, we can probably get where we've never been before. Now, if we, we, we did it, we don't do that. I'm afraid, this is my own opinion, the fourth revolution it will be for the very few beautiful ones, like, you know, so, and that's what we don't, it's technology to keep on dividing people. You know, we always talk about bridging the whatever divide, but we, we, we need to do what I'm suggesting. I think this is the, most reasonable way of doing it, if not the correct one. It is my opinion. And before I let you go, the last thing to ask, I guess, is what is your current preoccupation with, in, insofar as any research or work that you're currently busy with that's, that's taking up a lot of your time? I, I look into, I remember I said, into the interplay between language and development, uh, language and, um, uh, conflict uh, uh, prevention, management and the resolution, language and development. Can we really develop in Africa in the way that we change uh, our lives for the better, uh, excluding the vast majority of us? You know, you, you can invent high tech things, but if they are not user friendly because people don't understand the language they speak, then I think you better not, you know, waste any resources because you need to reach out. So this has been my main uh, preoccupation. I still supervise the students. I still am busy. We, we, we should have finished that long time ago, but for various reasons, it took us many years to finish a book on language uh, between the interplay between language and the democracy. You know, uh, how do you instill the culture democracy, respect for human rights in a language people don't speak. And I've got a metaphor I like when I speak to my students. I say, look here, food cooked in borrowed pots will never kill hunger. Because, you know, by the time you are trying to go and buy the ingredients, the owner of the pot say, can I have my pots? And sometimes <laughs> I tell them about the sangom. I said, you know, you know, each hour, they think the sangom are useful. <laughs> driving away the evil spirit. If you, if a Sangoma borrows one from somebody else, it won't work, it won't do the trick. <laughs> so, <laughs> these are the things I believe in. They have been keeping me busy, you know. You, you can't kill hunger with food cooked in borrowed pots. You can do whatever you want, that won't happen. <laughs> Well, I think that is the perfect point for us to leave it. And I do hope that before the village gains you once again, that we, um, we, we get uh, some more use out of you before you disappear back to, uh, to the village and speaking uh, Portuguese. So Zinio, this has been fantastic. I, I, I thank you so much for, for your time and for sharing so openly and so, so generously. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you very much for, for, for you to reach out to me. Uh, these are the things I believe in. This is how I see them. You know, it's like dancing. You know, so you say, well, whether I dance well or not, but this is the way I dance. Many thanks to Sozinho for his time and especially for those wonderful metaphors. Thanks also to you for listening. If you've enjoyed our time together, please rate and subscribe to the podcast and share it widely. For more information on the courses, webinars, and virtual events that eLearning Africa has available, please visit elearning-africa.com.